Hello, everyone. I'm Harpreet Singh, welcoming you to the Future of Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with William Kerr, a professor at Harvard Business School. He's the unit head of entrepreneurial management, co-director of Harvard's Managing the Future of Work initiative, and the faculty chair of Launching New Ventures program. Professor Kerr's book, The Gift of Global Talent, How Migration Shapes Business, Economy, and Society explores how countries and businesses compete for high-skilled migrants. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you today. Let's uh, begin with your involvement uh, in launching New Ventures Program and uh, the Future of Work Initiative at Harvard Business School. Tell tell us more about uh, both of these programs. I'm delighted to talk about our programs. Always free advertisement works, uh, works wonders. So Managing the Future of Work was created about four years ago, launched about four years ago with my co-director, Joe Fuller. We have a research team as well as a bunch of affiliates, um, both within Harvard Business School and across other uh, schools at Harvard University. We also even like to pull in some people from MIT and elsewhere uh, when we can. What we've been looking at are two key drivers for the future of work, technology, not surprisingly, and also demographics aging populations and changes that are happening in the workplace. And what we try to do is think about it from an organization's perspective. What if you are the CEO, CHRO of a leading company need to think about for where your organization must be in five to 10 years? And then how are you gonna help with your people get from here to there? And we try to think about it from the organizational competitiveness perspective, but also from the workforce skills and the transformation that enables that. We've got our own podcast series. I'll throw out that little bit of an advert. And we also uh, on our website have lots of free reports about things like digital talent platforms and ways that you can rethink your hiring process to find hidden workers and, and so forth. I encourage people to take a look at those. And then for the launching new ventures, that's actually closer to the entrepreneurial management unit, which you began with, uh, which I'm in, uh, the unit head of. LNV is a course that is about how to think about new opportunities and begin pursuing them, sometimes in the form of a de novo startup company, classic tech venture like yours, uh, and then sometime in larger organizations. And as we look at the future of work and the transformation that companies need to do, a lot of big businesses need to find new ways of kind of opening up the opportunities that will be there for them in five or 10 years. That's great. Uh, Give us a sense of your research uh, interest and some of the things you're currently working on. Sure. My broadest research interest begins with entrepreneurship and innovation and tries to understand how that impacts organizations, makes them more productive, helps them grow. How does that reshape the workforce inside the uh, company? And then kind of sitting around firms with, you know, in a Venn diagram sense, a bit of overlap, but it's also a bit distinct. How does a city think about that process or a region? And then how does a nation think about that process? And so what are the, um, what are the, what are the roles of entrepreneurship innovation in growth at all those dimensions? And then the second part, which takes us into global talent is what do companies and countries and cities do that helps that process? Where do they drop the ball or kind of get in their, you know, kind of trip over their own foot? Like how can the policy environment, the other things that leaders are doing uh, enable that process? That's a fascinating topic. Uh, Why do you think uh, that it's been really hard for cities to replicate the Silicon Valley? Well, so that's it. You just put your label on like the billion dollar question there. Uh, And I will go ahead and also give a free advertisement to one of my colleagues, Josh Lerner's book, The Boulevard of Broken Dreams, which goes into this in great depth. But I think people underestimate the degree to which Silicon Valley is a very complex ecosystem with different types of institutions and actors that have come together and really reinforce and support Anytime you see that type of environment, it's hard for someone to come in and just replicate that process anew. Uh, You can't get everything to line up in the the most uh, easy formats. Now, I wanna also though say that one of the things about talent clusters like Silicon Valley is that in the larger sweep of history, while they're very sticky at a moment, they tend to move around. 
uh, you know, there's been conversation about Boston, you know, and, and some of the loss of its activity towards uh, Silicon Valley. And we certainly worry sometimes about our MBA students going to start their ventures over there rather than staying closer to home. Uh, it wasn't so long ago people looked at Detroit and Pittsburgh as being kind of similar centers of, of, of excellence and kind of being at the technology frontier. So it does move around. Uh, and that means it's a lot of opportunity for places to try to find what can make them special and what, where, how they can unlock opportunities. But just trying to you know, write down all the things you saw in Silicon Valley and just go home and do it at your, yourself is going to be a difficult uh, task. We've heard a lot about your book, The Gift for Global Talent. Uh, perhaps you can talk about the main arguments of the book. Yeah, how can I summarize it? That kind of makes me chuckle a little bit because, you know, like most books, it's 60,000 words, which you can read it fast. It's not that many words. But um, I remember when I got ready to actually take the book out and you're going to go on shows, you're going to give presentations around it. People are like, give us the one, you know, slide argument about it. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know that I've actually done that. <laughs> and so it's getting kind of interesting to go back and think through it. I'd say that the first starting point is to recognize how much global talent has shaped businesses, economy, society. Uh, we really are early in the book bringing a lot of data and a lot of kind of examples to try to, to bring that top of mind. And this may seem a little bit obvious, especially to perhaps some of these podcasters, but I would remind people that we know far more about the little widgets that get shipped in boats across the seas than we know about knowledge workers that are going up in the airplanes in the sky. So we, there's a di difficult degree to which our data infrastructure has not kept up with the importance of this uh, phenomenon. Then I second try to think about how this has impacted the world make arguments that America has benefit, benefited from this substantially. In fact, it has been the greatest beneficiary of global talent flows, but also that many other places, in fact, the majority of other places have themselves in turn benefited from the migration of talented people. But then not like make this, uh, hey, everything is always hunky-dory, uh, shine a light on some of the challenges that individuals have faced and that uh, some cities have faced and countries have faced when the tides of global talent have kind of been adverse uh, for them. And I, I wanna do that in part because ultimately questions about migration and migration policy are, are political. And so you're gonna to have to have not just business and economic arguments, uh, you have to think about that broader span. And then the book kind of closes off with some ideas that hopefully can help make the environment more productive, starting with America, but in, in also thinking about other environments. So just peeling uh, each one of those, um, so can, can, can you kind of elaborate, maybe start with the, the, the what, what is the strategy in terms of from, from a policy perspective, or what, what, what are your recommendations to, let's say, the Biden administration? Well, the, you could think about big, big recommendations, and then you can think about where a lot of the book kind of ultimately centers. And it'll take us a little bit of time to kind of dissect those two, uh, those two avenues. U.S. immigration policy is substantial. It spans family-based immigration to employment-based immigration uh, with varying degrees of types of inflows. And one individual can actually touch upon multiple ones. My wife was originally on a student visa, had an H-1B visa, ultimately became a U.S. Uh, permanent residency through marriage to me, and then, you know, is today a U.S. citizen. So you kind of touched all those different pathways uh, through that. For the most part in the book, I try to take a relatively constrained uh, perspective around how could we make employment-based migration into the country better? And my kind of, you know, philosophy about doing that is first, when you get to big, 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 big questions about just how much migration we should have as a nation, that gets a lot more into the political side, gets a lot more into perspectives around you know, society and so forth. I have my own views around that, but that's not where my research is traditionally lied. It's also not where it connects most closely to businesses. When you go and look at the employment-based migration, one of my arguments in the book is that we can do a lot better by just better utilizing the visas that we currently have. 
So you and I don't have to necessarily hash out this decades long debate as to what's going to be the optimal amount of immigration into the country. We can even just start by taking one part of it and doing it better. And I've got proposals in there, for example, connected to the wage ranking of H-1B visas to try to think through how we could better prioritize the uses that we currently have and ideally get some quick wins that could come out of that, that could help us then open up the larger the questions and more thorny issues around broad scale immigration reform. I'm also trying to go through in various places and think about if you tinker with this one part of the immigration system, how do you have to think about some of the other aspects? So if you're gonna change how we treat employment-based visas, you also need to look a little bit back upstream and say, what's our student visa structure look like? And how are the student visas going to be accommodated or not under the change in the employment-based system? And so we try to kind of think through some of that, that logic. And then kind of maybe a, a last kind of thing, in addition to that big win, you know, a couple of quick wins here. Uh, one of the pieces that I would be advocating in a variety of, of spots is that the US is not really a, what I would think of as an immigrant engineering type country. Some countries are small and nimble enough that they can make a change, wait a year or two, grab some data, think about how it works, go back and make another change and you know, kind of go back and forth. I think we can all agree about US politics uh, that that's not the way it's gonna work uh, for, for us. And so my kind of advocacy is for much more flexible immigration structures so that we can adjust with the economy and the changes that need to be made um, uh, in a more organic sense, rather than having these extremely long debates for a reform that may or may not happen in the future. And, and what, what is your perspective on student visas? Would you change something there? I think the, uh, I would probably move towards more of a system that gave a guaranteed uh, time employment uh, in, in the United States following um, you know, being in a US school. Well, let me take a step back and explain a little bit you know, sort of why I'm gonna end up at that. Uh, sometimes I like to think about the US immigration system as being a set of pipes. And you have like a student pipe here and that's feeding into the H-1B pipe or to other employment-based pipes. And ultimately that's gonna feed into a permanent residency pipe and so forth. And where we start to get challenges is that some of these pipes are getting quite big and others are quite fixed in nature. So the student pipe has been growing substantially in size in large part because universities have the capacity to admit as many foreign students as they deem appropriate. Uh, there's not a limit on the number of F1 visas. And in a number of cases, this provides a, a great opportunity not only for access to global talent, but it, it's candidly a way for them to make the books balance as states have reduced their appropriations to universities. Being able to bring in a foreign student uh, who's going to pay full tuition uh, can help actually cross subsidize uh, American students uh, in there. And so you get this pipe is getting ever bigger. Now, if you recall a little bit earlier, I, pre I talked about among H-1Bs, I would like to prioritize the uses a little bit better. So that's this next pipe down, it's smaller. And our current structure is quite crude in how it allocates visas. It is basically on a first come first serve basis. Although in most years, uh, because we get such an avalanche of demand right when the system starts, it's actually utilized by a lottery over early applicants uh, to the system. And a consequence of that is that you can have someone who is doing rather moderate skilled work, uh, code testing or something like that, alongside someone who has a you know, very specialized advanced skill set that we really need to have in the country, and they're given equal weight uh, in, in the lottery uh, system. And so I would like to utilize the system a little bit better at that front, but most of the ways that you would approach that will, will work against that young college student trying to get their first job. So if you're gonna use a wage ranking system, it's gonna be hard for someone who's 22 years old just comes out of school to be able to compete uh, for one of those spots. And so trying to find some sort of agreed upon amount of time based upon everything from field of study to the level of degree to how much they were in school in the US to provide that early career opportunity and then ultimately have them be a part of a more uh, rigorous uh, system at the, at the back end. Yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Even, even for a software engineer looking for an H1 visa here in Boston, 
I think the starting salary has to be seventy six thousand uh, dollars or so, right? So no way an undergraduate is is going to be uh, at an advantage when when compared to a, a, a grad student or someone more uh, senior. Yeah, we just think we just recognize that over time, we all hope that our skills become stronger. We gain experience. We gain a lot of other things that get factored into um, into our wage. Mm-hmm. And at one level, from a policy perspective, we would like to use some of that information because it's valuable to recognize that this person right now is, will have probably a more immediate impact. But you got to step back and think about two things. One is there are certain industries, call it finance, certain places, Manhattan, San Francisco, so forth, that are very expensive and actually have higher salaries. And we don't want that just to swamp the system. So we want to be able to have people throughout the country be able to access uh, the visas. So you have to think through a little bit of the occupational limits or maybe some regional limits uh, around that. And then the second part is you got to recognize that we're really about kind of thinking of a long-term horizon. And it's not just this very moment, but if somebody has you know, maybe even come here as a young child and has been working up through uh, the, the you know, U.S. immigration system, has graduated from college, wants to stay and make a life here. How can we sort of give those opportunities the, the way to shine uh, and not just swamp them against somebody who's 35 years old and has lots of uh, experience as well? This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Expify platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.expify.com for more information. The, the two categories of people, uh, one would be folks who apply for H-1B lottery and, and don't get it. And, and, and the second is people who are uh, in, in an H-1B visa status, but uh, have to wait 20, 25 years to get a green card or permanent residence, right? So those folks tend to gravitate towards Canada. So when you look at um, global talent flows, is is Canada a big beneficiary of our inefficient system? I think Canada does benefit a lot from our our system. Uh, in fact, I'm on the, the board of a company called Bob Squad, which provides nearshoring kind of opportunities for tech talent who's been specifically de- denied an H-1B visa. Uh, and then they're trying to work with some of the employers. And I got to candidly say, when you look at some of the profiles of the people that missed the lottery for the third time, but they had graduated from college at age 16. You're like, wow, you know, yes, I can see why the employer wants to hold on to it and why opportunities in Canada are seeking to, to grab that talent. There is one side that, you know, we, we should recognize, which is Canada is roughly the size of California. And so what can be an enormous benefit for Canada is not necessarily going to be you know, catastrophic for the, the U.S. economy. I always kind of, you know, kind of put people you know, in, in the mentality of thinking about one of the distinguished advantages of the U.S. that it continues through today is that no country in the world can put global talent to work at the scale that America can. And we have places that are as different as Miami and Seattle, Boston and Los Angeles. Lots of opportunities to, uh, for people to match with the environment that works best for them. And if Canada was the size of the United States and had a better policy and was just there, I would be, you know, we, we would be having a, a much more uh, apocalyptic, you know, conversation at this moment. But, you know, as it is, um, a lot of countries and a lot of, in particular, talent clusters around the world are being able to pick off some of the talent that would like to be in America, but, but can't get access. Um, but we, we, our sheer size and the lack of another United States that has you know, the exact uh, policy structure we're describing has been um, 
has been a helpful kind of gives us buys us some time. In your book, you talk about uh, the role of foreign born talent in innovation specifically, how that's kind of gone up over time historically. Yeah. And can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So you go back to 1975, uh, 45, 46 years ago, uh, about one in every 12 inventors in America was foreign born. And today that number is about one in every three. So it's been a significant increase over time in the share of U.S. invention, similar parallel trend in the share of U.S. entrepreneurship that is connected to global talent coming into the country. It tends to be a little bit stronger in the more high tech or the more frontier of the fields. If you go all the way over to artificial intelligence, the shares are going to be even higher at that spot right now. But it's actually also just much more broad based as well. Like it, the, the differences across technologies are smaller than just the overall growth that we've, that we've witnessed. I, I remember it, or talked about early in the uh, conversation about the thesis of the book, kind of the special place of America in this. Uh, in the period from 2000 to 2010, if you looked at the inventors who are moving around the world, the US received roughly, I think, 57, 58% of the migrating talent. So we, you know, on like a kind of a trade balance kind of system, our inflow relative to our outflow was enormous. Same is true for something like Nobel Prizes. We have received well over 100 inbound people who are going to be receiving the Nobel Prize for work done in America, had relatively few people born in the U.S. that have gone elsewhere to do such, such prize work. So that's been a, a, a very strong driver. And then one of the things we try to unpack in the book is some of the broader implications of those beyond just the, the quantity side and beyond just kind of the superstar dimension side, but how does that impact things like the foreign direct investment uh, that companies make, the development of new startup companies that are going to be spanning across multiple countries uh, in the world and similar uh, topics. So it lo- looks like we've done something right from, from an immigration policy perspective. I think that's a tough one, Harpreet. I'm going to give you, that's a tough one. One thing that we have done, and I think it's more right than wrong, but, I, but it, it, it's, a, it's a question mark a little bit, uh, is our system favors uh, employment-based, employer-based decisions. And you can think of there's, if I had to give two kind of polar ideas, one is a points-based system where I take your CV, I look at your education, I look at how many languages you speak, I look at your age, I look at a bunch of things, and I rank you, uh, and I'm going to pull you in. And then another system, I'm not going to do any of that. Instead, I'm going to ask Microsoft, Microsoft, who do you want to hire? And I'm going to let you hire that person up to some amount. Now, even though I'm going to set them up as polar, and even though I'm going to say the U.S., shifts more towards the employment-based side. I just want to begin by every country has elements of both. So it's not as stark as I'm setting it up, but, but we are definitely tilted more towards the employment-based side. You might ask, why do we do that? Well, I think there's a couple of good factors that go into it. One is you have guaranteed work for the migrant after they come to the country, because it's all about the job that is being filled by the migrant. You don't get this situation of someone whose CV was fantastic and that they had a PhD in nuclear engineering, but when they get to America, there's no need for a nuclear engineer anymore. Like, or so so you, you find them underemployed relative to the opportunity. The second piece is firms actually have a lot of vested interest in thinking through things like, Harpreet, is he a team worker? Is he a creative individual? Does he have this specialized knowledge that maybe only has a, you know, an associate's degree attached with it, but it's more valuable than a master's degree in some other field that's more outdated? Firms have a lot of capacity to discern that type of information. And so by incorporating them into the decision process, we can do it in a way that a point system just could never keep up with. In the book, I, I kind of date myself by using the, the poison song, Every Rose Has Its Thorn, to kind of highlight that there's a, though a lot of things that can come back to bite you about having an employer-driven system. 
Uh, in some of the cases that I mentioned earlier, that there's not really any constraints upon cities or occupations uh, or nationalities in terms of how visas are used. And so the system can swing significantly uh, across relatively short time periods uh, in terms of the composition of inflows, which is both evidence for flexibility, but it can also, uh, if you're, for example, a student early in college who's taking the signal that this type of software programming is going to be very important in a few years, and then suddenly the market has lots of people that are working in that space. Uh, you, you, got, you got the wrong signal uh, early on. Uh, a second thing that we have to really think through uh, and this is significant, is that anytime as a policymaker, you have to be thinking ahead as to how is a firm and the firm's incentives going to shape the de facto implementation of the policy. And if in this situation, I'm saying to Microsoft or I'm saying to General Electric or Ford Motor Company, hey, you get to be the one that gets to pick out the immigrant, I better be darn sure to think in my mind as to What's going to be their motives? How are they going to approach this choice? How are they going to select among applicants? Because effectively we've you know, outsourced the immigration process around employment decisions to the employers and said, you tell us who you want to do. So you need to be aware and thinking through unintended consequences that can come from the visas uh, and so forth. There's a few other kind of smaller thorns, but those are kind of some of the big ones. Bill, with CEOs and CHROs as your audience, what are, what are some of the key principles uh, in building a global talent strategy when it comes to the corporate sector? I want to start actually, let me broaden that back out and let's stay on the, on the country for a little bit because this is one place where I do see a lot of initial overlap between corporate and country. Mm -hmm. And the starting point to recognize is that today, 2021, people have a lot more options than they did a decade, two decades ago. Uh, and that's across other fantastic organizations you could work for, as well as also clusters all around the world that are starting to compete for, uh, for global talent. And so just like every marriage market, dating market and so forth, the first question is gonna be, are you attractive? Like what, what makes you attractive? For a country that can be things like the resources for career opportunities, can be a quality of life uh, that you're gonna be provided. <laughs> you know, at some level, do you have a nice warm sunny climate versus a frigid Northern cold climate? Uh, that, those things can matter. Uh, and then for, univer uh, for corporates, uh, there's gonna be a lot of the similar uh, kind of questions or choices about what kind of resources can you, uh, can you bring for somebody's career? How can they advance themselves? How can they challenge themselves? Do you give them access to some of the frontiers to work on? And then the more subtle one, the one that I think is often underappreciated, but I've kind of made it a little bit of my mission over the course of this book in discussing it to try to raise its profile, is around stability. And let's go back to that dating idea, which is, you know, you can find someone attractive, but if you think they're going to flake out on you every other week, or they're, you know, going to, you know, not be a stable long-term partner, that's not somebody you want to commit to. And I always come back to global talent flows in the end on the migrant side are an investment process. It's a lot like finding a, a spouse or partner or buying a home or opening up a chemical plant. Like in all these cases, you are taking a longer horizon choice. And the one thing we know that can really dampen that or, or destroy that is a lot of uncertainty in the process. And so I challenge both the firms as well as also the, the, you know, the governments around there is what kind of horizon or stability are you giving to global talent that gives them the confidence to make those choices? And let me go, you know, I mentioned earlier that my wife had been through the various parts of the US immigration system. I will attest that at no point in time, at least while we've been in, uh, associated with it, would I call the US immigration system user-friendly? Like it wasn't like I felt that every, you know, red carpet was rolled out and every step along the way was, was meant to, uh, uh, you know, to make it as smooth as possible. But the benefit of America, and you mentioned earlier, we must've been doing something right. The benefit was always so great that you were willing, everyone, many people all around the world were willing to go through those steps in order to get to the other side and be part of that. 
And the biggest challenge I find for U.S. immigration right now is not one deviation of this policy or that, but that increasingly, as immigration has become more politicized, we are damaging the confidence that people have in kind of the long-term horizon or path that, um, that they can have in the country. And that's, that's one of the biggest worries I have. We've uh, talked about uh, the role of government, the corporation in the, in this talent ecosystem. There's another stakeholder, which is the, uh, uh, the education sector, the uh, higher education. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so w- w- what are your thoughts on that? How, how, do, how does higher education respond to the challenge of uh, bridging the skills gap? And, uh, you know, how, how do they think about uh, uh, attracting people from the outside and so forth? Well, that's, a, that's another big question. You're just kind of launching big question after big question here. I am again, let me again deviate a little bit. And I want to go back to managing future work and kind of the broad theme of, of your podcast series. One of the big messages that we take into the, the business landscape to the corporates is to recognize that I, I work in a university. I love universities but we're, we're still slow moving compared to the, the rate of change that's going on. And we're, we're starting to cycle as fast as we can, but let's be honest. If you are a leading organization, you're a leading firm, you're gonna to have to think about yourself, how much of this am I going to need to take on internally? And the more that you can help your workforce make that jump from here to there, and it's not just a one-time jump. It's like, you know, because as soon as you get there, there's going to be the next jump and the next jump and the next jump. So the more you can help them continually renew their skills and put that structure in place, it's going to be a big competitive advantage for you. Moving back into the education sector, we know some of the biggest challenges. Uh, And one of them is, first, we were all set up to do relatively early in life education. Kind of equip somebody, get them all armed up for their life, put them out in the workforce, and then you just work on the next generation because you know that somebody's gonna stick with that for, for a long period of time. And that model is now, it's, ne- it's effectively over because of the rate of skill obsolescence and transformation and change uh, that's going on in all parts of the economy, but especially in the digital uh, landscape. And so we have to be reworking ourselves to have multiple entry points uh, and exit points and to not think of it as just you you bite off a whole apple at the beginning and you're done, but instead, how are we going to be with somebody at many points through their careers? I suspect a lot of organizations from undergraduate or community colleges up through um, master's degrees and so forth are going to be thinking about how they, from the beginning, give a promise of we are your lifetime partner for your education and skills uh, development. So that requires a, an enormous shift uh, in terms of how an organization is set up, designed and function to make. The other, uh, I think, relatively clear uh, at this time challenge that we all face is we're, we're awfully expensive. And there's a phenomenon that was named after an economist called Will Balmall. It's called Balmall's cost disease. And basically the idea is that if you're making a flat screen TV, technology gets ever more productive. And so that, you know, you can get a TV today for $300 that a few years ago would have cost $5,000. We don't do that in education because when I go into a classroom, I'm still teaching 93 students, just like I was in 2005 when I began at Harvard Business School. And there is, of course, digital opportunities and platforms and stuff that we're going to try to take advantage of to to leverage that scale up. But we don't, I don't think everyone really knows how to do that yet. And if there's one thing, you know, we can, we're going to talk, I think, of some about the pandemic. And, you know, there's many lessons we learned from the pandemic. One thing we also learned is that people actually liked being in the classroom a lot. And we were working really hard over the summer not to say, hey, we're a Zoom eternal at Harvard Business School from here on out. But instead, how are we going to get all the classes back in person? Because that's what students really valued. Uh, And there's a number of factors that are behind that. um, And it will vary across schools from a research university to a community colleges that where they fit in in these various competency based learning, digital landscape and so forth. But we have a lot to learn, but we recognize the big gap to where we ultimately need to be for the future of skills. 
so Bill, you've, you've done a lot of research on tech clusters uh, and then you kind of touched upon this earlier. G- give us a, a, a sense of your research and uh, what, what have been your findings? I think one of the first things I've done is try to just bring more attention to how extraordinary tech clusters are uh, and their impact today relative to even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. One of the statistics that I, I like to give to people or talk through is that um, if you go back again to 1975, reason for dating it in 1975, that's when a lot of our data really begin. At that point in time, if you looked at Chinese and Indian contributions into the San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley speaking, it was about one in every 220 patents in America. Probably enough for like a local news article, but it really wasn't something that was going to make national headlines, you know, so to speak. Today, uh, 2020, about one in every 10 patents in America is either invented or co-invented by a Chinese or Indian ethnic individual living in the San Francisco Bay Area, which that's just truly extraordinary. And one way to kind of think about the size of that is that if I took the state that made the least patenting and added the state that made the second least, third least, fourth least, kept adding up states, you add up 30 states, the bottom 30 states in terms of innovation output, you get one in every 10 patents in America. So this is, uh, you know, one super cluster and two, you know, obviously the biggest uh, and, and dominant ethnic groups in, in terms of driving that cluster. And then you start to follow on from there, all of the business implications and why organizations are saying we need to, you know, have our feet on the ground or our ears in Silicon Valley and trying to understand them. It's also been part and parcel to this accelerating rate of technical change. And, um, Research that actually uh, I've, I've seen at least a, a very thoughtful exposition of this by Deloitte researchers uh, in Harvard Business Review in 2009, but I, I try to extend it forward, is this idea that at some point when the speed of change becomes so much, it becomes less about what you've learned in the past, per se, compared to how well you're able to observe what's happening right now. Like what's the transformation that is undergoing? What's the new business model that's coming to life? I think we see a lot of organizations, both with respect to making sure that they can touch upon the key clusters. And then if you come even more closer, if you're in the Boston area, it doesn't, you know, out where I live, it's not the same as if you're down in Kendall Square, you know, right near the heart of the action. So even within a city, how are you able to get closest to those sources of knowledge uh, and, and build from that? And that has significant implications for how firms structure themselves. You start to see a lot more people trying to put key decision makers, key innovators into environments where they're able to be closest to that source of information. But if you are the CEO or CHR of the organization, what you realize you've done that is what you've done is you've minimized that distance, but you've created distance in between other people in the organization and them. And at some abstract level, what you are constantly trying to do is manage distances. And historically, one of the great things about the suburban office park was that we minimized all the distances among the firm. Now we are un, you know, unbundling some of that for rightful reasons, but we now we've introduced new distances. And so town clusters are both pulling people in. They're also requiring organizations to rethink their physical footprint their intellectual footprint, and then how they manage that process uh, that results. With with the changing perceptions around hiring and rise of remote work, uh, thanks to COVID-19, the the pandemic, you you see that uh, the the center of gravity is again going to shift to the suburban office parks and, and maybe have an impact on this distancing? That's, you know, you, you've asked several million dollar, billion dollar questions. That's like maybe the trillion dollar question <laughs> that's from here. I, I'll begin by saying nobody knows. Let, let's be just kidding. No, I mean, a lot of people pontificate, but nobody knows. One of the things that um, is important to observe is that there are always breaks upon the talent cluster system. Principally, they've come through high rental prices Uh, both for corporate uh, office space as well as personal uh, living space, and then extremely high wages. 
And those breaks were already evident for San Francisco and Boston and many of the other uh, environments. Uh, they were also evident of just how powerful the pull of those places were, but that was already starting to have companies rethink and shift that back. And I think the pandemic is going to cause even more thought process. And that, that's perfectly fine. And I would love to find innovation spread out a little bit more and so forth. But let me give a couple of counter arguments. So I think the, the idea of, hey, we, you and I are having this conversation with Zoom right now, makes it seem so natural that we could do this. There's at least a couple of counter arguments that I would give to say, don't count out count talent clusters just yet. So the first thing is, you, we, we've been talking about some about these trends from 75 to, to present. If you were to get the book, highly recommend it. If you were to get the book uh, and you looked at the graphs and the figures, they're all unbelievably smooth, upward sloping graphs. You know, and I, I sometimes reflect upon that, that during that period of time, we saw technological revolutions. We saw the personal computer gets created. We saw CRISPR, we saw the internet, like you saw a whole bunch of that stuff. We also had multiple wars. We had 9-11, we had the great recession. So in other words, we threw a lot of stuff at that. And you know, this, this could be the one that bends it down, but when you've seen all of that other stuff, you gotta question whether you know, you're overreacting in a moment uh, to something that's more of a, of a deeper trend. The second thing is much more micro. And I like to, you know, if I have an audience, try to get them to answer the question of, you know, what's the number one destination of emails from Harvard Business School? And people give me various answers. And of course, somebody eventually says Harvard Business School, which is obviously the, the, the correct answer when you think about it. Now, I'm on the second floor of the Rock Center in Harvard Business School. And the number one destination from the second floor of the Rock Center is also the second floor of the Rock Center. And the same actually ends up being true with phone calls and with other technologies that we can say can create and allow for all sorts of distance, sometimes we find they can actually reinforce place. Uh, yesterday, I was in a faculty meeting uh, for the entrepreneurial management unit, and we had both a large physical presence inside a conference room. We also had probably 10 faculty members joining via Zoom. Uh, some were in other even parts of the campus due to health reasons they couldn't perhaps come into the facility. Others were just, but it was hard to kind of walk out of that and say, oh, now the business school, the EM unit can just become fully distributed and spread. In fact, maybe the ways that we can connect the dots even better, the ways that we can integrate the faculty virtually will actually reinforce the value of people being in the same place at least a good chunk of time so that they can engage in the innovative and, and, and collaborative work. Now, that's gonna be a, the, the, what we're all gonna observe, learn, experiment with over the next um, 30, 40 years. A number of organizations have already moved significantly into hybrid. A number were founded you know, completely remote from the start. And well, organizations will find their way across the spectrum. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't at this point completely sell off all your property in the Bay Area if you happen to be lucky enough to own it. Bill, any parting words for our audience? I appreciate the chance to come on and, and, and talk about uh, this. I think one of the places I will begin with is a parting thought. I work with a lot of business leaders on future of work questions. And it sounds almost silly, but maybe the one thing I can add to their deliberations especially if they're not at one of those elite places that is kind of driving the future, but instead they're absorbing and trying to keep up with the future, is that the leaders often need to reframe their task. They've historically had the right answer, and they think right now that their job must be to have the right answer. And I try to challenge them a little bit of, I think your job increasingly is asking the right questions. Uh, and getting your workforce to help you engage in that journey. Uh, and that's probably the, the route for you to, first off, unfreeze yourself and unfreeze the organization, uh, but then also make sure that you are in the best position, whichever scenario ultimately arises. Thank you, Bill. It's such a pleasure to have you here. I appreciate you having me.